Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to the HIV Cure and Immunotherapy Forum. And delighted to have so many people here with us here in Brisbane today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sharon Lewin. I'm director of the Doherty Institute at the University of Melbourne in Melbourne, Australia. I'm also the president of the International AIDS Society and the international co-chair for the IAS 2023. So it's really, really exciting as an Australian to be welcoming the IAS conference back to Australia. I'm also the co-chair for, for the Towards an HIV Cure initiative, which I share with Tumbi Ndungu from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. And uh, the Towards a Cure HIV initiative has been an incredibly successful program from the IAS starting in 2010 by Professor Francoise Barre sunusi So I'm just delighted to be able to continue the great initiative <clears throat> that Francoise started so many years ago and to see the field of cure science just grow and grow has been fabulous. Now, as we always do in Australia, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting. That's the Jagera and Turrbal people have the, um, as the traditional owners, and I pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today. Over the time that you'll be in Australia, for the non-Australians, you will hear either a welcome or an acknowledgement to country at every official event. This is a very important part of our history and respect paid to First Nations people. It's a particularly important time right now in Australia as Australians are about to take a referendum on whether there will be a voice to parliament for Indigenous people, which is something I feel very strongly about. So you are, I hope you take some time to learn about this issue while you're here. Now, this forum takes place every two years. I have been um, largely leading this uh, together with my partner in crime, Steve Deeks, who's probably outside the room as he normally is at official openings. But Steve and I have been very active in uh, trying to identify the hottest issue at the moment in cure research and having a single day focused workshop on that hot issue. And this year, it is on um, immunotherapy and HIV, an area that is growing, HIV cure, an area that's growing rapidly, and we're beginning to see some initial signs of success. Not only is it a hot issue, but um, Australia has an incredibly proud history of research in immunology. Um, two very important immunologists were our Australian and Nobel Prize winners, that's McFarlane Burnett and Peter Doherty. We're here in Brisbane at the home where the discovery of the human papillomavirus vaccine was made by Ian Fraser. And in our opening session, we'll be hearing from Ranjani Thomas, an outstanding immunologist who works in autoimmunity. So immunotherapy and HIV cure is an incredibly important part of our science, but we also are in the right place to be discussing it. So the main goals of today's forum First of all, to see if we can work towards a unified def definition of what we now call post-intervention control, as more and more clinical trials are done with immunotherapy, ART is stopped and people can successfully control viral replication, how to best define what post-intervention control means after an a immunotherapy intervention. We want to understand the biological impact of immunotherapies and particularly the mechanisms of how these interventions are working. And also learn from advances in other areas, autoimmunity, as we'll hear from Ranjani, cancer immunotherapy, and the incredible advances that are happening right now with um, mRNA therapeutics. As mentioned, we'll start with a keynote from Ranjani Thomas. We like doing this sort of um, thing in HIV Cure workshops to bring in someone outside the field to get their perspective on how they have advanced their own work outside of HIV Cure and how we can learn from that, particularly in the world of immunotherapy. So thank you very much, 
Ranjani for joining us. We then um, have two sessions focusing on broadly neutralising antibodies and combination studies, vaccines and immunotherapies before breaking for lunch. You've got quite a long lunch. Um, I should add the food is fantastic in Australia and particularly great in Brisbane, so make sure you get something good for lunch. Come back here ready for the gene and cell therapy session and mechanisms of post-treatment and post-intervention control. We've mixed up the order a little bit, so we're going to start with the clinical trials and end with the mechanistic work. We then will have a great panel discussion um, chaired by Steve on the implications of a diversity of approaches to HIV cure research and um, a discussion on, on language around cure. Um, if you've been reading the newspapers of the last 24 to 48 hours, there's been an incredible um, publicity around and a great achievement from the IAS that not one single abstract in IS 2023 contains the words HIV infected individual, HIV infected person. It's an incredible achievement and it was done by screening all of the abstracts to make sure that we use the language that was most appropriate of people living with HIV. So language is powerful, language is important, language is meaningful to so many people and also language can be very confusing if we use a mix of terms that are not understood by our colleagues and most importantly by the community. So we'll have a presentation by Michael Luella from the Delaney AIDS Research Enterprise for an HIV cure. Some great work that's been done amongst the Delaney collaboratories in the US around language of cure, but we now want to get input from a much bigger global audience. And finally, um, we'll wrap up with a poster session. Please make sure you stay. <clears throat> Posters are a great way um, to discuss science. They're a great way, particularly for younger investigators, to present their science. And it's a great way to get a free drink as well, because we will make sure, and we have got um, alcohol there, or any other drink that you care to have, to make sure that you stay until the very end. Um, Today's forum wouldn't have been possible without the dedication of the program committee. Um, we have had uh, a very intense period of planning for the program committee. The co-chairs for this meeting are all experts in HIV cure and immunotherapy. They include Tumbi Ndungu uh, from the Africa Health Research Institute in South Africa, um, Beatrice Mote from Ixia Hospital University in um, in Barcelona, Tony Kelleher from the Kirby Institute from the University of New South Wales in Australia, Heather Ellis from Positive Women Victoria, and you'll hear from Heather in the opening session, and of course, the wonderful Steve Dix. We'd also like to thank the IAS in Geneva um, who have worked tirelessly chasing all five of us over the last six months to create the program, but particularly to Marlene Bra, Julieta Fermat, Neil Barrier and Ricardo Madalozzo. So please join me in acknowledging all of the IAS and their contributions. <laughs> and with that, I wish you a, a great forum, a great conference, and I'll hand over to Marlene Bra. Marlene is the project manager, is, a pro, is overseas programs at the IAS, but she's very, very important for um, driving for the Towards a Cure initiative, which we'll tell you more about. Over to you, Malak. Thank you very much, Sahan. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you all today, and I would like to say a few words about the Towards an HIV Cure initiative for the few of you who may not know about the Towards an HIV Cure initiative. Um, you know that the uh, initiative focuses on advancing the HIV cure field in setting where resources for HIV cure research are limited by facilitating interaction with HIV and other biomedical research areas. And the Towards an HIV Cure initiative promotes science through the organization of uh, pre-meetings as this, the one we have having today, and pre-conferences ahead of the AIDS or the IS uh, conferences. 
Uh, furthermore, uh, since 2012, IES has published the three global scientific strategies towards NHIV cure, which is a groundbreaking document on the global overview uh, of HIV cure research. And it was updated in 2016, again in 2021, and we will soon be working uh, again on uh, the next strategy. The initiative supports actions through the Research for Cure and the Advocacy for Cure Academy and a dedicated scholarship program for the Academy's alumni. The Research for Cure Academy aims to strengthen research capacity on HIV cure among early to mid-career investigators. Uh, on the other hand, the Advocacy for Cure Academy trains advocates and peer educators in translating and communicating on current HIV cure research directions to advance community understanding of the latest research and lay the foundation for advancing HIV cure research and successful trial uh, conduct in their local context. Every year, uh, we have a number of alumni from the Q academies uh, attending uh, the pre-meeting and the IS conferences. And we are delighted this year to welcome uh, nine scholarship recipients uh, who are joining us today. Uh, in partnership with AVAC, the initiative supports action through the Advocacy for Cure grant program by providing alumni of the Advocacy for Cure Academy with a grant to expand the skills acquired through the academy training and to implement a project related to HIV cure advocacy in their context. IS has been working with AVAC since 2018 to track global investment in HIV cure research. And you may find, if you have not found them yet, we're launching uh, today the 2021 uh, cure tracking document that should be available outside of a room or what you may be, uh, what you will have access to uh, today. This paper represents a unique tool to monitor global investment in HIV cure research and identify trends in HIV cure funding, as well as to promote further commitment to HIV cure research. We look forward uh, to having a great day of uh, meeting with you today. We thank you for joining us. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our community representative and one of the forum's co-chair, Eva Ellis, uh, from uh, Positive Woman Victoria, for a few words of welcome. Thanks again for being here. Uh, um, yeah, good morning everyone from Brisbane, Australia. So my name is Heather Ellis and as a woman living with HIV, I'm very proud and honoured to be asked to represent the community for this welcome to the IAS HIV Cure and Immunotherapy Forum, where, we'll, where we will hear presentations from researchers from around the world on the latest cutting edge science in finding a cure for HIV. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land which we meet today, the Jagera and Turrbal people, I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge all my brothers and sisters globally living with HIV and all the HIV scientists and researchers who have developed and continue to develop our life-saving antiretrovirals and their work in finding that elusive cure for HIV. With the rapid advances made in HIV cure research in recent years, to a non-science person like myself, it really does look like that day is close. Um, I've had many careers over the years, but my proudest role is as an HIV communications specialist, HIV advocate and author. Presently, I am the communications and engagement coordinator for Positive Women Victoria, Australia's only fully funded community organisation supporting and advocating for women living with HIV. I have lived with HIV for 28 years. I was diagnosed in London in 1995. I was healthy at the time and had just traveled Africa solo by motorcycle. The HIV test was a requirement for a three month Russian visa. Uh, Russia was my next destination on my world motorcycle journey. My diagnosis came a year before the discovery of effective antiretrovirals in 1996, but I did not find this out until late 1997 when I returned to Australia with AIDS. From London, after my diagnosis, as I was still symptom free, I had continue, continued my travels through Central Asia and China. There were no smartphones or Google back then, and I was oblivious to the impact these effective ARVs were having on people with HIV. 
They were literally rising from their deathbeds. I too rose from my deathbed 10 days after being admitted to Cairns Base Hospital. And thank you, Dr. David Ho and his team and all the other scientists for discovering these effective ARVs and perfecting these treatments over the past 27 years. Since late 1997, when I started on ARVs, I've experienced no side effects other than those early days of sequinivia squirts, as they were called back then, and a very brief and scary few weeks on DDI. Fortunately, no nerve damage was done. I quickly achieved an undetectable viral load a long time before the impact of U equals U was understood and accepted. For many of those years, my favourite saying when I disclosed my status to family and friends was HIV treatments are as good as a cure. And I would have been blissfully happy to continue in this belief, and why not? I am fit, healthy, a mother of three boys, I live a productive and happy life, and I still ride motorcycles. I have no side effects. There is no reminder that I am living with HIV other than taking a few pills morning and night. I take multivitamins anyway. Having travelled Africa and Central Asia, where so many people had helped me and given me hospitality, and knowing that millions of people with HIV did not have access to the same life-saving HIV drugs that I did, has always upset me. When you're lying on your deathbed with next to no T-cells, riddled with PCP, gasping for your every breath, all that matters is ARVs. Today, of the 39 million people with HIV, nearly 26 million are, are on treatment, but millions are still waiting. While it's easy for us living in resource-rich countries like Australia to collect our meds every six months and have our bloods and viral load checked, it can be complicated for those living in regions like Africa, where access to ARVs is very difficult or limited. Distance from the clinic, lack of resources for viral load testing, stigma, where six months supply of pills which rattle say only one thing, and disruptions in supply, or what researchers term the brittleness of the HIV drug pipeline, mean that ARVs for people in these regions are not as good as a cure. There is also the ongoing issue of HIV, HIV drug resistance, which is well established with Veference, one of the most widely used HIV drugs in many regions of the world. It's now superseded by Doltegravir, which I read, I read is reporting emerging resistance too. Will long-acting Cabrotegravir follow? Apparently, there is a consensus among some scientists that it will. So in some settings, we shouldn't take for granted that HIV drug resistance is a thing of the past with newer and long-acting drugs. While well, my HIV drug regime, Moroviric, Doronavir, Ritonavir and Reltegravir is rather complicated than most due to those early years of swapping and changing due to side effects, it works perfectly for me. But my regime could also be because I have wild virus uh, from ground zero. However, lately I'm no longer so sure ARVs are as good as a cure. Back in 2016, the new buzzword in HIV science was low-level inflammation, with its source likely to be the HIV reservoir. Understandable, as the body knows something foreign is there, but just can't quite see it. In recent years, researchers have found just how damaging this low-level inflammation is to the body, especially the cardiovascular system. For women living with HIV who are going through menopause, we have an added layer of inflammation, which reports suggest makes us even more susceptible to these cardiovascular issues, further impacting on our health as we age. While I have easy access to hormone replacement therapy to counteract this inflammation and thereby protect my heart health, many women around the world don't. A cure is usually important to not only eliminate HIV everywhere, everywhere so that it goes the same way as polio, but access to ARVs for the rest of life prevents, presents ongoing challenges. While the challenges of travel to care, cost, monitoring and security of supply is in uncertain political situations like the war in, Uc in Ukraine all impact on access, 
For those of, living, of us living with HIV, stigma is always there too. Fear of disclosure, fear of rejection, fear of violence. Then as mothers, we fear transmission to our babies if we breastfeed, even though the risk is almost zero, 0.3 per cent. Guidelines that allow us to breastfeed and our healthcare providers themselves are often so conservative, so discouraging, that many of us don't have the confidence to breastfeed our babies. But there's more and more reports of no transmissions are recorded when the mother is on ARVs with a sustained undetectable viral load. Our confidence is growing, and so too are the confidence of healthcare providers and governments. So in recent years, I've come to realise that managing HIV and achieving the UN 95 targets by 2030 may not be as easy and the only way out of the HIV epidemic on a global scale is finding a cure. I and all my brothers and sisters living with HIV everywhere are with you in your search. And when you find that cure, I truly believe, as many others do, that the groundbreaking science that you discover will not only end HIV, but will pave the way in how science can help the immune system fight many other diseases and conditions that affect the human body. And just one last thing on a personal note, in four years, I'll be riding my motorcycle from South to North America, as my three teenage boys will be independent and I can safely leave home, apparently. <laughs> but I don't have the space to carry 12 months supply of ARVs. So I do hope we have that elusive cure by then. Thank you so much. Good morning, my name's Tony Kelleher and I've got the pleasure of introducing our plenary speaker. But before I introduce her, I just want to talk about why we chose Ranjani Thomas to, to give this plenary. So we all work away uh, in our little boxes uh, trying to understand the details of, of manipulating this virus in the immune system. Uh, and I think it's really great if we get outside perspectives to sort of stimulate us and challenge us about the way we think about those interactions. I think everybody in the audience is aware of the great advances that immunotherapy has made in cancer, but I think ironically we're less aware of the advances uh, in immunotherapy around the manipulation of autoimmune disease, which is, I think, ironic given that this virus lives in the immune system. So when the opportunity uh, came to uh, identify someone uh, that might be able to educate us all, uh, I could think of no one better than Ranjani Thomas, who is a professor of uh, rheumatology at the University of Queensland and the Fraser Institute there, and a consultant rheumatologist at the Princess Alexandra Hospital. Uh, Ranjani is a true clinician scientist. She, is she has studied uh, the pathogenesis of uh, a range of autoimmune disease, diseases, the spondyloarthropathies and uh, type 1 diabetes, tried to understand the immunopathogenesis of those, particularly around the breaking of tolerance, identify biomarkers, and through that, start identifying approaches to therapy. She's developed vaccines against rheumatoid arthritis and has developed uh, immunotherapy, which he has taken from the bench to the bedside through industry collaborations uh, uh, for rheumatoid arthritis and is now working on similar approaches uh, for type 1 diabetes. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce our plenary speaker, Ranjani Thomas. Thanks, Ranjani. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for uh, the invitation. It's um, very exciting to be here, actually. Um, so I'm going to first talk about um, why people get autoimmune disease, and then a little bit about uh, tolerance, and then come back at the end to try to bring it all together with some potential um, insights into curing HIV. And these are my disclosures. So um, we have the same issue in autoimmune disease. We have no cure 
for diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, which is a chronic inflammatory disease that involves the joints and other organs, including the cardiovascular system. And 70% of patients have autoantibodies, and the uh, key ones that are most specific are the anti-citrinylated peptide autoantibodies, or ACPA, uh, which precede diagnosis by about 15 years. So once patients are diagnosed, they need lifelong treatment with disease-modifying drugs, drugs like methotrexate. Um, and there's no cure, and uh, that means few people can, some people can withdraw their drugs, but few people can stay off them for more than five years, or up to five years. And type 1 diabetes is a, another autoimmune disease uh, commencing in children rather than in adults um, and young adults. And they get beta cell, the islet beta cell specific antibodies, um, such as towards insulin, which again precede diagnosis. In this case, we've got no disease modifying drugs approved after onset. And there's a variable duration of partial remission for up to two years in, in children, longer in adults. Um, and a recent phase two trial of JAK inhibitors did improve C-peptide and reduced insulin use. Um, and, and as I'll show you later, this means that there's less recruitment of T cells to the islet. And anti-CD3 was recently approved for multi-antibody positive dysglycemic prediabetes, so-called stage two diabetes. Um, and in a short course, an ascending dose promotes e exhausted CD8 T cells. So in um, rheumatoid arthritis, we have a situation, yes, you can see my mouse, where we've got um, people developing who are asymptomatic developing these ACPA autoantibodies. And these people, um, although they don't have symptoms, might smoke and uh, might have microbial triggers due to uh, gut uh, permeability um, and inactivity and raised BMI. And then there's uh, a crosstalk between T cells and B cells so that there's um, expansion of follicular helper T cells in people that have the genetic risk uh, for rheumatoid arthritis, leading to expansion of the uh, epitopes and then um, glycosylation, particularly at the FAB region. And this V region domain glycosylation is through T help mediated somatic hypermutation. And that actually on the surface of the B cell reduces the binding of the autoantigen to the autoreactive B cells, and that means that they resist tolerance. So we've got this very interesting situation in which the genetic risk is particularly around the HLA molecules, the class two, and genes that regulate and amplify T cells. Um, and then we've got presentation of autoantigens through uh, inflammatory issues occurring, particularly in the mucosal sites, in the lungs and gut. And then um, the development of autoantibodies, um, deficient regulation, and the autoantibodies become more sticky um, and cross-reactive. And then we've got damage occurring in, in the cartilage and the bone. And the environment, um, exposure to um, um, microbes in the mouth and in the gut uh, through smoking, uh, silicon, uh, obesity, uh, meat eating, and uh, sugary drinks are bad. Uh, but protective are um, a healthy diet with fish, uh, uh, vegetables, um, exercise, being pregnant for as long as that, as that lasts, and uh, a moderate amount of alcohol and a healthy microbiota as a result of all of those things, and stopping smoking, um, which all lead to uh, greater regulation. So we have a very good understanding of what you need to do to protect yourself from getting rheumatoid arthritis, and we're very uh, keen on finding first-degree relatives so that we can educate them, and they're very keen to do something so that they don't get it. So which T cells perpetuate inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis? They were very interested to find this out. And when it became possible to look using single cell um, technology and T cell receptor sign t signaling, uh, sorry, sequencing, we collaborated with Mihir Wechelakar in Adelaide who does arthroscopic synovial biopsy. And we took um, a paired peripheral blood and synovial tissue from four recent onset untreated ACPA positive uh, HLA DRB1 0401 RA patients and sorted their white cells um, from the blood and the tissue and sequenced with the T cell receptor as well. And here I'm just showing you how the T cells um, separated into CD4 and cytotoxic CD8 and CD4 
which um, is the total from that blood and the synovial tissue mixed together. And when we um, sorted them out into clonotypes, so expanded cells, um, you can see that for the top clonotypes in the blood, they were all cytotoxic T cells. And in the synovial tissue, the majority of, the top, of all the clonotypes were cytotoxic T cells. And there was um, also some um, uh, CD4 um, T helper uh, GATA3 positive T cells. Now, when we had a look at the T cell receptor CDR3 region to see um, what might, whether there might be TCRs that were in the database. Um, using glyph convergence group, you can see that the top um, glyph convergence groups contained uh, predicted virus-specific CDR3 betas, and in the immune epitope database, we're able to predict um, uh, uh, HIV, sorry, <laughs> MHC targets um, for class one for EBV in particular in um, up to 6% of um, the peripheral blood or the synovial tissue T cell receptors, and some for the class two. And then we demonstrated um, that EBV and CMV uh, specific T cells were there, and here I'm showing you for CMV, 1.7% um, expanded this um, RPH, um, B7 RPH clonotype. Um, and this was shared between the peripheral blood and the synovial tissue, and this was a CDR3 um, that had predicted this epitope, and indeed it was found in that patient. Um, and in the synovial tissue, uh, we also noted an interferon-stimulated gene signature suggestive of a viral signature in the synovial tissue. So we did some imaging mass cytometry of the synovial tissue from that patient who had the CMV, um, expanded clonotype, and um, here you can see, um, this was done by Helen McGuire at Sydney Cytometry, it's beautiful staining. Um, and this is the lining layer of the tissue with uh, class two positive macrophages um, around the lining. And then here are the blood vessels in green and surrounding that are CD90 positive fibroblasts. And around that are the monocyte derived dendritic cells. And the T cells are nestled between the fibroblasts and the dendritic cells, and they're both CD4 and CD8. And we were able to find the clonotypes that we had identified in that area and coming through blood vessels here. And this is in an area rich in IL-6 stained by immunohistochemistry. So this is the same tissue here. So we were really interested in whether this uh, latent CMV uh, in rheumatoid arthritis might be relevant to the disease um, development. Um, so with Maria Pierre, Dias Bosti and Iona Schuster and Chris and Donio um, in, at Monash, uh, we did, uh, we made a model. So um, they infected BALB-C mice with uh, mouse CMV, waited until they went into latency, so greater than 70 days, and then uh, shipped them up to us, and we induced um, ovalbumin-specific antigen-induced arthritis in these mice um, with a series of prime and then injection into the joint. And uh, if the mice had MCMV and latency, the arthritis score was more severe than if they just had um, antigen-induced in arthritis induced. They didn't get uh, reactivation of the CMV. However, when we looked at the joint draining lymph nodes at the takedown, we saw that in mice that it had latent MCMV, both the CD4 um, over-specific T cells and the IE1 CD8 cells that were specific for MCMV were more activated, more memory, and made more pro-inflammatory cytokine. So the model that we're um, working with now is that these CTL are present, really we see them in um, great abundance in synovial tissues from all our active RA patients, um, that they're cross-recognizing um, viral and other infectious antigens by cross-presenting dendritic cells. And those dendritic cells are also presenting self-antigen uh, relevant to the disease and that they're activating these CD4 T cells and keeping them in an effector uh, status. We've also got pro-inflammatory cytokines from the um, uh, constitutive uh, fibroblasts and macrophages that are, and, and interferon, which are activating these uh, dendritic cells. And that's keeping this in a pro-inflammatory uh, state. And these CD4 T cells are providing help to B cells to keep the autoantibodies uh, produced by plasma cells in the follicles. Now, th 
we know that the phenotype signaling and location of CD4 antigen specific T cells is critical to the outcome of this interaction. So let's look at tolerance now and see whether that could be changed. So for immune tolerance, it's probably not something that most of you think about very much, but um, it starts in the thymus with central tolerance and um, after um, recognition of the single positive CD4 T cells, they then um, undergo clonal deletion um, if they're seeing antigen, self-antigen very strongly. But in order to become uh, regulatory T cells, the single positives need to see um, self-antigen presented by dendritic cells or thymic epithelial cells and to be signaled through the T cell receptor and CD28. And, um, and they need to see that for a period of time and then that needs to be interrupted. And that interruption signal, as Al Singer showed in a beautiful paper uh, earlier this year, is TGF beta. And once that happens, the Tregs upregulate FOXO1 and can become FOXP3 positive. And those FOXP3 positive cells regulate effector CD4s, and they need R2 for survival and expansion. Now, the same process, it turns out, occurs in the peripheral lymph nodes. So when we have uh, self antigen being presented at, in low doses by dendritic cells that are not very co-stimulatory, low levels of co-stimulation, uh, presenting continuously to CD4 T cells, they expand and um, undergo uh, a phenotype, develop a phenotype of antigen-specific energy. And again, after interruption of these signals, again by TGF beta, the cells can become uh, FOXP3 positive, but another um, uh, 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 um, ligand which can do this is CTLA-4. And CTLA-4 interacts with CD80 on dendritic cells, and CD80 also binds to PDL1. CTLA-4 can pull CD80 into the T cell and expose more PDL1 checkpoint molecules to interact with PD1 to enforce that energy. Now, as, before I go into inflamed tissue, just um, that this is really a specialized area in the gut and there are specialized dendritic cells that are, um, uh, have evolved really to do this, to tolerize ourselves to our food and commensal, ant commensal antigens. And they produce a lot of retinoic acid, have low levels of co-stimulation, and there's a lot of TGF beta in the gut microenvironment. Now, in contrast, in inflamed tissue, we've got a lot of co-stimulation, we've got activated mature dendritic cells and, um, and pro-inflammatory cytokines. And as it turns out, IL-6, down-regulates the TGF beta um, receptor on T cells, and so it makes them more likely to become effector cells. Now, just switching to another very nice paper um, where they looked in um, uh, cancer patients, um, so metastatic and uh, non-small cell lung cancer, receiving um, immune checkpoint blockers, and again did single cell sequencing and TCR um, sequencing and looked at uh, clonotypes and where they were um, in, the, in the lymph. So they looked at lymph nodes, they looked at blood and the tumor site and uh, what their phenotype was of the same clonotype. And uh, in the tumor, as you would expect, with a lot of antigen being presented with a lot of uh, TGF beta and low co-stimulation, there was expansion of CD4 Tregs and also cells with a TFH phenotype. In the peripheral blood, um, there were um, clonotypes um, circulating, but in the lymph node, um, there were the same clonotypes, but they were more TCF1 positive and um, L-selectin positive. So they were had the receptors, homing receptors, required for residence in the lymph node, and also TCF1 allows them to proliferate. So it's very important uh, to look in different sites because uh, those uh, T cells might be from the same clones, but have different homing and function. So also uh, TCF1 has recently been shown in um, uh, auto, autoimmune disease, so in type 1 diabetes. This is um, work from uh, Andrea Schietinger, um, who came from the cancer field and looked into type 1 diabetes in the NOD mouse model. So um, the key autoantigen for CD8 CTL is IGRP, 
and uh, they looked at IGRP-specific uh, CD8 cells in the pancreas, the pancreatic, and the pancreatic lymph node. And they found two populations of IGRP-specific CD8s in the pancreatic lymph node, one of which was TCF1 high and the other one TCF1 low. Now, the high cells had hallmarks of lymph node residency and proliferation potential and uh, a more naive phenotype, whereas the low um, TCF had uh, chemokine receptors for inflammation and the hallmarks of antigen experience and indeed uh, um, exhaustion. So um, the effector molecules were in fact also found in the pancreas. So the TCF1 low cells were found in the pancreas and um, so these were called the autoimmune mediators, the TCF1 low and the progenitors, the stem-like cells. Now, interestingly, um, uh, these, these cells were important for causing uh, the inflammatory uh, lesion in type 1 diabetes, but if you block um, the um, movement from the pancreas, sorry, from the lymph node to the pancreas, they don't have long-lived potential. So the diabetes just died out because those CTL actually didn't have longevity. And in order to maintain diabetes, in transfer studies, they showed that the TCF1 high stem-like cells were needed to induce the development of type 1 diabetes. So this tells us that this stem-like uh, progenitor is very important for the uh, de maintenance of inflammation. And in fact, in the previous slide in checkpoint inhibitor uh, treated patients, it's the progenitor, um, uh, uh, progenitor stem-like cells, which actually are able to, or the TPEX, which are able to wake up rather than um, a switch back from the phenotype of, um, uh, ex of truly exhausted um, or regulatory cells, they're not able to switch back to naive, but it's the progenitor effectors that wake up. So now to come to tolerizing immunotherapy. So can we kind of leverage all this information to do something for patients? And so the idea here is antigen-specific suppression or elimination of pathogenic responses while maintaining protective immunity. And so our solution to this has been to deliver class two restricted autoantigenic peptide while blocking co-stimulation by dendritic cells through NF-kappa B inhib inhibition. So what we developed um, over many years was actually a liposome uh, nanoparticle where the shell entraps calcitriol and NF-kappa B inhibitor and the core entraps an autoantigenic peptide and this can be switched depending on which disease you're interested in targeting. It um, takes uh, those uh, active ingredients to the draining lymph node. They're taken up by pd one positive dendritic cells, and then there's prolonged antigen presentation at that site and expansion of pd one positive CD4 T cells and T regs in a pd one dependent manner. And we've shown that there's suppression of arthritis-specific models. So here you can see the um, red labeled liposomes arriving in the subcapsular sinus of the draining lymph node very rapidly after injection and uh, coming down and starting to be taken up um, by those dendritic cells in the T-cell area. And the pd one you can see in an inflamed lymph node, is really situated right around the lymphoid follicle, the B-cell area. And this is exactly where we're seeing the uptake of the liposome and presentation. So um, this is a um, model, and I just wanted to show you the upregulation of the checkpoint molecules. So here we uh, inject the liposomes twice and then prime the animal with proteoglycan. And this is primed um, intraperitoneally. So the proteoglycan is the um, uh, autoantigen. It goes to the mesenteric lymph node. The liposomes are given subcutaneously and they go to the inguinal lymph node. When we give um, proteoglycan twice, the mice developed anti-human human proteoglycan antibody, and this cross-reacts with mouse proteoglycan, and then uh, that draws in neutrophils, um, which are bound through the FC receptor to become more destructive, and uh, it, it destroys the cartilage and leads to inflammation, and that brings the T cell in. So it's really quite similar to human RA. And uh, just to show you that when we uh, look at the inguinal draining lymph node um, after the um, uh, takedown of this experiment, which is right after two, two weeks after the first prime, 
Um, you can see that if we uh, don't give the liposomes, uh, we've got a few tetramer-positive T cells, we've got a lot of expansion in the inguinal lymph node if we give two shots of liposomes, um, but these um, upregulate uh, PD, sorry, PD-1 and CTLA-4, um, and in the mesenteric lymph node, they become FOXB3 positive, and the follicular helper T cells start to assume a less um, effector um, uh, phenotype. So another really important part of um, antigen-specific immunotherapy, you know, how can a single peptide actually lead to a whole autoimmune disease being suppressed? And that's bystander tolerance. So we can demonstrate that here in this uh, mouse model of no, um, type 1 diabetes. And so we uh, gave a liposome that entrapped a CD4 mimetope. Um, that uh, expanded regulatory CD4 T cells in the draining lymph node, the inguinal. And then these T cells were able to migrate to the pancreatic lymph node. And the, here the cross-presenting dendritic cells are presenting IGRP-specific uh, uh, autoantigen to the CD8 T CTL, but also can recognize that CD4 mimetope. And here the regulatory T cells regulate the entire dendritic cell function and that suppresses um, the interferon production uh, of the CTL and the um, cytotoxic activity leading to beta cell survival. So uh, now just to tell you about a clinical trial that we've recently completed and published. And here we made uh, liposomes entrapping collagen type 2, uh, which, which um, is presented by two of the HLA molecules associated with rheumatoid arthritis and calcitriol. And uh, our primary objective, so this is a really small trial, we're looking at safety and immunomodulation, and we're using tetramers to look at the antigen-specific response, but also the bystander response for citrinylated um, vimentin-specific CD4 T cells, which should interact with B cells making autoantibody. And then we looked at the clinical response. And again, small trial, a few cohorts and single dose ascending. So um, just to uh, tell you the liposomes were well tolerated. Um, we're looking at the change in collagen-specific T cells here. This is a placebo, low, medium, and high. And you can see this gradient effect. So in the low dose, we've got expansion of collagen-specific cells. In the high dose, we've got reduction in the peripheral blood. Cipfermentin, same thing, expansion at the low dose, reduction in the medium and high dose. And with the clinical response, you see that the best response, everyone was below the remission line here by um, 57 days in the low and medium uh, uh, groups, but not so in the high dose. So there was one patient here who had very active disease and they flared um, after the high dose. And you can see even with the lower doses that there was an increase in disease activity, although minor. So we, we did see an increase in PD sorry, PD-1 on the collagen-specific cells, as expected. And interestingly, the vimentin-specific cells in the low and medium dose became more CCR7 central memory-like for lymph node homing. Um, in the low dose, we had um, a reduction in V-domain glycosylation with the, lo um, the low dose compared to the high dose. So I'm... Um, just going to quickly tell you with the um, uh, reduction in disease activity score um, in those patients who were treated, this was associated with an expansion of antigen-specific T cells, and those T cells became more naive and more CCR7 positive. So I'm just going to skip that. So really, our opportunities for prolonged remission with tolerizing antigen-specific immunotherapy are to give prolonged low doses of antigen-specific immunotherapy. We'd rather use this in inactive rather than active disease in people who are in remission. And with our idea is to maintain remission with antigen-specific immunotherapy and lifestyle intervention and to find T cell biomarkers of active disease remission and longer remission after disease modifying drug withdrawal. And the same idea with type one diabetes. So we've done this in um, a small cohort of patients who were either active or in remission. And what we found uh, with the um, change 
um, in uh, antigen specific, fermentin specific T cells um, between uh, the baseline and 12 months after therapy was um, that as the disease activity improved in patients, so these T cells actually expanded from the baseline. So it seems to be a, a common phenomenon that the antigen specific T cells are expanding in remission. And these uh, expanded T cells had reduced memory differentiation and reduced ex expression of chemokine receptors to access inflamed tissue and germinal centers. So um, just to kind of uh, show you how we're thinking about this, here's the patient getting the liposome. It's being presented by the dendritic cell. It's expanding these collagen-specific T cells or contracting them. And then they're, um, if they're expanded, they're getting to the lymph node draining the joint. They're interacting with dendritic cells that can also present citrinated vermentin. And those vermentin-specific T cells are CCR7 retained in the joint draining lymph node, and they're able to regulate these ACPA positive B cells. Um, however, if the T cells, uh, collagen-specific T cells are um, reduced in the peripheral blood, they may be becoming effector cells and going into the joint, or they may be dying. And in new onset disease, um, our hypothesis is that um, T cell chemokine receptors favor lymph node residence and exposure to persistent low levels of self antigen presentation to promote local regulation. So I just skip that. Uh, and um, here I just want to sort of uh, bring it to a, 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 um, a point for you. Um, just having read some of the literature around HIV latency and cure. Um, I think one way to think about the uh, cells which are um, infected with um, HIV is that they have a tolerance phenotype. Um, so having looked at the recent phenotypic signatures in lymph node in the peripheral blood, um, I think they're likely to be having, not, they're not, not seeing antigen, but they've got low level antigen presentation by persistently infected myeloid APCs, similar to what um, is taking up our liposomes. There's low levels of inflammation, and there'll be persistence and in survival in, of infected CD4 T cells in the lymph node and multiple checkpoint molecules on the infected CD4 in the peripheral blood uh, have been shown. And they have high TGF beta receptor and the CTL look exhausted. And so you might consider reversing latency uh, like breaking tolerance. And so some things to think about are um, presenting antigen in a more immunogenic way, potentially targeting uh, more immunogenic dendritic cells, thinking about TCR signal strength, because that definitely um, uh, is, is relevant to the dose of antigen, CD4 licensing and activation-induced cell death um, of CTL, and um, leveraging, or at least cell death of the infected cells, and leveraging the clonally expanded uh, polyfunctional CMV and EBV specific CTL, which are really present in all adults, and try to help to locate um, these the sites of inflammation, and uh, potentially mobilizing those TCF1 positive CTL progenitors, um, and uh, replenishing uh, specific CTL, uh, potentially using CAR-Ts to, de to uh, overcome the depleted reserve, and making uh, people more autoimmune-like with checkpoint and TGF-beta signaling relief, um, and thinking about neoepitopes and uh, the function of different HLAs and their ERAP um, uh, genotype. So that's um, my thoughts, and I won't go through all the acknowledgements because I'm out of time, but thank you very much. Thanks, Ren, Jenny, and I think that demonstrates that even in chronic conditions with the right interventions that are targeted, you can manipulate the immune system very effectively.